from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Good evening and welcome to the 2016 National Book Festival Gala Celebration. This is my first public event as the new Librarian of Congress and you guys. <laughs> and it's also my first opportunity to welcome a large gathering to your nation's library. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a wonderful, wonderful way to begin. Our program this evening is being live streamed on YouTube, so thousands of people outside of this room and outside of Washington are able to join us. And I think that's so important to be able to share the collections and programs of the Library of Congress with as many people as possible is my priority as librarian. And it also builds on the legacy of my 13 predecessors. Now this event is one of the highlights every year, and I am honored to be here with you. It's a national book festival that brings together our greatest authors, poets, illustrators with their many fans, and I'm one of them, that includes all of you joining us here tonight. I want to thank a few people because no event like this happens without a lot of work by a lot of different people. We have members of Congress here, the United States Congress has built and sustained this library, and I'm so appreciative that you're here to celebrate this achievement. The Library of Congress is one of the greatest gifts, the legacies that the Congress has given. Thank you. Also, thank you to the embassies of Italy, Latvia, Mexico, Spain, and Uruguay for providing us with such wonderful talent for our international and food stages. I want to say a special hello to Ambassador Carlos Gianinelli of Uruguay, who is with us tonight. Also joining us this evening are the many sponsors who make this event possible. Mr. David Rubenstein, the festival's co-chair. AARP, you may clap. The Institute of Museum and Library Services. The Washington Post. Wells Fargo, FedEx, FedEx, Scholastic, the National Endowment for the Arts, the James Madison Council of the Library of Congress, and there are many others. Because of your generosity, this festival, and I think this is the most important part, is completely free to the public. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Plus, there are more than a thousand volunteers who give their time. Library of Congress staff, the general public, the Junior League of Washington, and our introducers from the Washington Post, National Public Radio, and numerous other media organizations. And speaking of library staff, I have had the privilege to get to know so many of them in a short period of time. And more than a, two dozen of them have worked for nearly a year on planning tomorrow's event, which will offer the most 
impressive lineup of authors in the 16-year history of the festival. I'd especially like to acknowledge festival organizers Guy, Sue, Jean, and Marie. Please stand up. My first meeting right after the swearing in was a briefing on the book festival, and I felt like I was at the command center. <laughs> it was something, and it was filmed by CNN, so you might see it this weekend. <laughs> the beautiful image you see behind me is our festival poster. It was designed by Yuku Samizu, and she wanted to convey the idea that books take us on journeys. They open up a world of possibilities. They make us ask questions and encourage us to look for answers. They are essential to the human experience. And I remember my parents giving me books when I was a little girl. And I remember vividly the moment when I realized those symbols on a page were words, words that translated into ideas and stories. And I was hooked. Reading and a love of reading literally changed my life. And as Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. You will be free to explore, to dream, and make your own history. Our wonderful festival co-chairman, the patriotic philanthropist David Rubenstein, was also touched by the power of books. When he was growing up in Baltimore, his dad would send him to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. I know a little something about that place. <laughs> where he would check out the maximum number of books allowed each week, 12. He finished before the week was out. And he has said that the ability to read and the love of reading, quote, got me where I am today. And he has called reading one of the joys of my life. And David, I do second that emotion. But celebrating reading, as he has enabled us to do with his extraordinary support of the National Book Festival, is only a part of his mission. He's also troubled, as many of us are, by the persistent struggles in our country and around the world with illiteracy. His dedication to make sure every child and adult shares the opportunity and experience of reading moved him to establish and support the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. The awards recognize organizations that have made outstanding contributions to improve literacy, encourage the continuing development of innovative methods for combating illiteracy, and support the wide dissemination of the most effective practices. By recognizing current achievements, the awards seek to inspire others organizations, foundations, and other private sector groups to become involved in battling illiteracy. In a few short years, those awards have provided more than $1 million to support dozens of organizations, both in the United States and the world. I think there's a video. <laughs> Here at the Library of Congress, it's our mission to provide the American people with a rich, diverse, enduring source of knowledge. And the ability to read and write is critical to fulfilling that mission. It's why we support the thousands of organizations around the world working to promote literacy, advocating for change, and empowering families, adults and children, to learn to read and write. Literacy offers so many life-enhancing benefits. People who can read and do read are healthier, happier, and live longer. They are more likely to get preventative health care and less likely to go to an emergency room. Globally, women and girls who are educated have fewer children, and those that they do have are twice as likely to survive. 
Everyone benefits from literacy. For every 1% increase in a country's literacy rate, there's a permanent 1.5% increase in their gross domestic product. David M. Rubenstein's creative vision and generosity support the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Each year, the Literacy Awards program recognizes some of the most innovative and effective organizations promoting literacy in the United States and around the world. Through these awards, we celebrate literacy organizations and the dedicated people who, through passion and hard work, are bringing education and literacy to an unprecedented number of people around the globe. We hope to inspire others to emulate these groups and to do their part to help end illiteracy in their own communities and beyond. We still have a long way to go. Together, we're making tremendous progress. Please join us in recognizing the winners of the 2016 Library of Congress Literacy Awards. American Prize winner, Parent Child Home Program. International Prize winner, Libraries Without Borders. David M. Rubenstein Prize winner, WETA Reading Rockets. We are grateful to David M. Rubenstein for his vision and commitment to literacy in America and throughout the world. More than 60 organizations have been recognized by the program and more than 25 million people have been served by those organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David M. Rubenstein, co-chairman of the National Book Festival and the creator and sponsor of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Thank you very much. Um, my mother did not make that movie. I, <laughs> I, I want to uh, just express on behalf of all Americans our delight that Carla Hayden is now the Librarian of Congress. Um, um, Obviously, we've had a lot of great librarians of Congress, but somehow we've never had a woman be Library of Congress. We've never had a person of color be a Library of Congress, Librarian of Congress, and now we have a perfect combination. So I think it's long overdue, and we have a person who's extraordinarily interested in books. She has also some other features that I can't resist mentioning. She came from Baltimore, where I'm from. Um, she was the head of the Enoch Pratt Library, which gave me my first library card. She has a graduate degree from the University of Chicago, as do I. <laughs> and she loves to read books and encourage other people to read books. And no quality could be more important in the Library of Congress. So Carla, we're very much uh, indebted to you for taking this job at a salary decrease from what you had in, in Baltimore. But uh, public service is very important, and uh, you will re be rewarded in heaven, no doubt, for having done this. <laughs> um, I realize all of you came to hear about the National Book Festival, and it's spectacular. Um, it's an incredible event. It was conceived of 16 years ago, really, with an idea that Laura Bush, uh, at the, at the uh, inauguration, inaugural events, asked Jim Billington, then the Library of Congress, if you have a National Book Festival. She had one in Texas, and he said, no, but we'll get one. And Laura Bush and he put it together. It's now uh, an incredible event where, where more than 100,000 people will be there tomorrow. Uh, more than 125 authors. Maria has lined up spectacular groups of authors. Many of you are here. Um, just as an American, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to come here because you can't imagine how many people are delighted to meet the authors, to hear them read from their books, to, to have questions of them, and to get autographs from them. It's a spectacular event, and as, and as the librarian said, um, it's free. And uh, so it's going to be a great event for those who haven't been there uh, yet. You will never really uh, forget this event. Um, we normally right, go right into talking to have some authors, uh, and you'll hear them in a moment. But we just thought tonight it would be a good idea just to remind all of you who love books, and everybody here loves books and loves reading books and loves making certain that other people are encouraged to read books, that we are a, a majority, but not as much a majority as we should be. Um, it's hard to believe this, 
but roughly 14% of the Americans uh, in our country, the richest country in the world, cannot read. They are illiterate, functionally illiterate. Maybe they can read a stop sign, maybe they can sign their name a bit, but they can't really read past the third grade level. That's 14% of Americans, one-seventh of Americans. Um, if you are illiterate, you have a very modest chance of enjoying life. Um, so many people who cannot read uh, earn much less, on average about 40% less than people who are literate. But there are other problems. If you cannot read, you have a much greater chance of going into our criminal justice system. 85% of juvenile delinquents are illiterate. And roughly two-thirds of all the people in our federal prisons and state prisons are illiterate. So obviously, if you cannot read, there's a big disadvantage in our country's, uh, country's ability to, to give people the joy of living that they should get and, the, and, and live up to all the freedoms that this country is supposed to be about. So it's a sad situation, but it's another situation that's just as important to me, and that's something called illiteracy, illiteracy, which means people who can read but choose not to do so. This is hard to believe, but roughly 30% of people who graduate from college never read another book. Hard to believe. And it's also hard to believe, but it's also true, that roughly 50% of Americans have not been in a bookstore or bought a book in the last five years. Also hard to believe that roughly 25% of Americans, all Americans, have not read a book in the last year. Now, this is sad because all of us know that the pleasure of books is that it brings you in a different world. It can take you, as it did for me, from a modest background into somebody who, who really enjoys books, can meet people all over the world, and can have a much richer life. So as tomorrow uh, you are at the National Book Festival, and as you hear the authors tonight, I'd just like everybody to think for a moment, what can you do to help improve literacy in this country? Illiteracy and illiteracy. So just think about it, in addition to writing books, reading books, and, and encouraging people to do so, just think about what uh, event, what, what event you could be involved with or what organization you could be involved with. So the uh, organizations that are going to be honored tonight are, are terrific organizations and I appreciate all of them coming here this evening, uh, but they are really just representing a small section of the people doing outstanding work. They did outstanding work and we're going to recognize them, but we should all realize that all of these organizations need additional financial support, they need your help, your ideas, and really if you take, take anything away from this evening and tomorrow, it is that while books are wonderful, we need to encourage people to learn how to read books and also once they learn how to read, to actually read the books. So uh, tonight you're going to have an enjoyable evening, but first I would like to give out the awards to the uh, people who have won these awards. So why don't we begin to do so and why don't I ask the Librarian of Congress if she would come up here. Carla? Okay, ready? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, here to receive the award on behalf of America Prize winner, Parent Child Home Program is Sarah Walter. Here to receive the award on behalf of international prize winner, Libraries Without Borders, is Alistair Chang. Here to receive the award on behalf of Rubenstein Prize winner, WETA Reading Rockets is Sharon Percy Rockefeller, President and CEO of WETA and Noel Gunther. Check is in the mail, and they'll get the money soon. <laughs> okay. uh, 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 uh.
It's very hard to uh, surprise someone like Mr. Rubenstein, as you can imagine, but hold on for a minute. Because you have been so generous. I mean, he's like, what is she doing? <laughs> this is really fun. Uh, you have been so generous to the library, to the nation, and to so many people. We thought we'd surprise you with a special something okay. given by a special person. Uh, uh, guess who this might be given by? Oh. We are, one of our honored uh, authors is Mr. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is a professor too in his way, and he's an, uh, just wonderful, and he has a special presentation for you. Okay. Wow, okay. You could imagine what went into the planning of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So way to go, David. Thank you well, so thank much. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm the chairman of the board of Duke University, and we never could beat UCLA when uh, <laughs> I was there. Uh, I didn't play at Duke um, because to dunk the ball, I told them they had to lower it to about six feet. And uh, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome novelist and memorist Edward Dan Titcott. Good evening, bonsoir, and congratulations to the award winners. What an incredible honor it is to be with you, to be here with all of you tonight. Being at one of the first events being hosted by our new Librarian of Congress, Ms. Carla Hayden, is phenomenal. <laughs> it's also wonderful to be here in Washington, D.C. on the same weekend that the National Museum of African American History and Culture will be officially opened. <laughs> The ancestors must be rejoicing just a little bit about this weekend. Speaking of ancestors, I'm glad that tonight's theme links journeys and literacy because it gives me an opportunity to kick off with a line from our Librarian of Congress at her swearing in ceremony. Ms. Hayden, you said, people of my race were once punished with lashes and worse for learning to read my people too. And this is why I often call myself an accident of literacy. I am an accident of literacy because I risk not existing at all. My parents grew up during the father-son Duvalier dictatorship in Haiti, which lasted from the 1950s to the 1980s. The first 12 years of my life were spent living under that dictatorship. Growing up in Haiti, I knew many children who'd had a parent killed, sometimes a father, before they were born. This often took away the possibility of their being able to go to school and getting an education. I am an accident of literacy because I might not have been able to attend school at all had my parents not journeyed here to the U.S. like thousands of immigrants, some of whom are being deported today. Parents who have no choice but to leave their countries, their families, and even their children behind for the possibility of a better life elsewhere. I am an accident of literacy because it is the money earned from my parents working, sometimes two jobs, sometimes around the clock, in New York sweatshops, factories, kitchens, and car washes. Their salaries from these jobs paid for me to start on my journey to learning to read and write. I am an accident of literacy because when I was able to join my parents here in the United States at age 12, 
if we were undocumented, I might have been shut out of the public schools that eventually allowed me to learn English and put me on a path towards reading and writing and my adopted tongue. I am an accident of literacy because some libraries might have refused me entry or access or a library card. They might have put up a wall between me and those hundreds and hundreds of books that I didn't know I needed, wanted, to help me imagine a better journey and a life beyond the barred windows of my family's crammed two-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. I am an accident of literacy because even though I was new to the United States and new to English, some of my teachers refrained from telling me that certain words, thoughts, ideas, and dreams were unavailable to me. I am an accident of literacy because all those things that could have happened to me did not, in part because of struggles that others have fought and continue to fight today. I always tell people when they ask who my best writing teachers were that they were the storytellers of my childhood. My grandmothers and aunts, who were not all readers, some of them were not even literate, but they carried stories like treasures inside of them. And every once in a while, on a dark night, when the lights were out, or even when they were on, they would tell me stories because there were some things that they did not want me to forget. They did not want me to forget what it is like to laugh, to be afraid, to feel sadness, and to feel joy, all sometimes within the scope of a single story. To these great storytellers, griots, raconteurs, audienceurs, every story was a gift that you carried with you until it was your turn to pass it on. And even if you did not understand the story fully as it was being told to you, one day it would become clearer when some event would show up in your life when you would need a story most on your path or on your journey. And that story would appear again like an ancestor or an heir, someone yet to be born. Which is why this wonderful celebration of literacy also makes me think of so many both here in the US, as Mr. Rubenstein said, and around the world, for him, literacy is still beyond reach, either for political or socioeconomic reasons. Many are not allowed to read and write or can't afford to learn to read and write. Theirs is one of the shadows that dims some of our joy as we celebrate literacy and the individuals, writers, librarians, and institutions like this one that nurtures and supports literacy. As Richard Wright wrote in his 1945 memoir, Black Boy, after borrowing a white man's library card and forging his handwriting so he could borrow books from the library, Wright wrote that, quote, reading can be a passion, a hunger too great to be contained. Words can also be used as weapons or counter weapons. Words help us experience the depths of what is possible for us and others which is why literacy is so often closely monitored, suppressed, or forbidden by oppressors, bigots, dictators, tyrants, and their like. And maybe this is why our ancestors might be a little bit pleased tonight and this entire weekend, because not only are we celebrating reading and writing, literacy and the word, but we are also celebrating some, like our wonderful new librarian of Congress, who have become living stories as well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome science writer James Glick. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm honored to be here, especially at, um, at the very beginning of what's going to be called the Hayden era. <laughs> I've just been, I've been working on a book about time travel for a while. And, and when, I, when I told people I was working on a book about time travel, I got all kinds of different reactions. But I think my favorite was a woman who said, cool, have you ever done it? And I, I have a feeling that she was disappointed by my answer. <laughs> because, of course, nobody actually gets to hop into a DeLorean and speed into the past and meet our parents as teenagers. 
we can't plunk ourselves down in the saddle of a time machine and turn the lever that sends us to the 31st century. Much as we might want to meet them, there aren't actually time travelers from the future walking in our midst. Still, nowadays, time machines are a great cultural totem. The time machine is a well-known movie, actually a whole slew of movies and TV shows and comics and everything else. But of course, first and foremost, before all of that, the time machine is a book. It was a little book. The American edition was sold in New York by the publisher Henry Holt for 75 cents. Eventually, the young man who wrote it, H.G. Wells, became an international celebrity, a historian, a visionary, champion of world government. But in 1895, he was just a son of shopkeepers, fresh out of school, desperately hoping to make a living as a writer. He wrote The Time Machine and rewrote it again and again, working late at night by the light of a paraffin lamp and finally found a publisher who paid him 100 pounds for it. It wasn't easy to make a career out of writing books in Victorian England, but it was possible. Wells wrote to a friend, someday I shall succeed, I really believe, but it is a weary game. In 21st century America, it's possible to make a career out of writing books, but it isn't easy. And forces of technology and commerce are combining to make it harder every year for young writers. I think we all know that our commitment to literacy and our commitment to the writing life have to be inseparable one and the same. I have time traveled, by the way. <laughs> and so have you all, readers and writers. There was a massacre in Haiti in 1937, all but forgotten. Edwige Dantica takes us there. In 1914, Theodore Roosevelt hauled and paddled dugout canoes down the river of doubt in the Amazon rainforest. Candace Millard takes us there. We can leave our busy electric present and turn the clock back 60 years to a small Iowa town where a dying pastor is preserving his memories and reconnecting with his own past. And the clock turner is Marilyn Robinson. And of course, a lot of writers aren't busy recreating the past. Instead, they're trying to invent the future, our best sense of the future, and, and maybe our worst sense, the future we can hope for, the future we should fear, they both come from the imaginations of writers. You want to take a journey, we're all time travelers nowadays, and the book is our time machine, and the library is time travel headquarters, which I guess makes the Library of Congress the time travel pentagon. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> the great Ursula K. Le Guin put it this way, story, is our only boat for sailing on the river of time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome historian Candace Millard. Thank you. I can't tell you what an incredible honor it is for me to be here among so many distinguished authors. And I had just the unbelievable privilege of meeting Dr. Hayden earlier tonight, and I will never forget it. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Um, 
I grew up in a, a small town in Ohio, and it, it was a great place to grow up. It was safe, the people were nice. There were a lot of woods and streams and ponds that froze over in the winter so we could skate on them. But if I look back at my childhood, the happiest moments I had were spent in the library. And it, it was a great library. It was in this old uh, two-story red brick building with wide front steps. It had a small room in the front for children's books. It had high ceilings and creaky wood floors, and it smelled like old books. If it was a nice day or even a cold one, I used to sit outside on the front steps, and I would dangle my legs over the side, and I would feel the sun on my face, and I would read the books that I had just picked out. And I was never happier than in those moments. Then one day when I was about nine years old, I went to the library, you could walk there from my house, and I saw this small vertical revolving rack of paperback books. And there was this handwritten paper sign on top of them with just one word, and it said, free. And we had always had books in my house because we always went to the library, but I didn't have very many books that were mine, that actually belong to me. So I stood in front of that revolving rack and I turned it and I turned it around and around. And these weren't children's books, so I didn't know any of them, but one finally caught my eye and it was called I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And again, I was just this kid from this little working class town in Ohio, so I had never heard of this book. I had no idea what it was about. I had no idea who Maya Angelou was. I just liked the title and the cover. So I pulled it off the rack and I slipped it in my pocket and I brought it home. And I didn't know it at the time, but that walk, that small journey from the library back to my house, past the hardware store and the elementary school and JB's where we used to stop to get deep fried mushrooms. That walk I had made a thousand times before would be different this time because I began to read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Of course at nine a lot of it confused me and some of it scared me, but for the first time I realized that books could be more than just entertaining or educational. They could be beautiful, and they could be moving, and they could not just teach me, they could transport me. As I grew older, books became not less important to me, but even more. I turned to books when I went to Ethiopia on assignment for National Geographic for the first time, and I was scared. I wasn't scared because I was in Ethiopia. I loved it there. I was scared because I was new at this, this was my big chance, and I knew that I was going to mess up. So every night, tired and worried, I would climb into my sleeping bag under my mosquito net, and I would reach for my book. And instantly, I would be in another world, a world in which whatever happened, it wasn't my fault. And I didn't have to worry about it the next day. I could just be whisked away. I also turned to books when my husband and I had a child who was born with cancer. And every night in the hospital when she fell asleep, I would sit in a corner of her room with a bottle of water and um, some beef jerky from the vending machine and a little book light and Harry Potter. And in a flash, I would be in Hogwarts, far away from all the terrors of the day. So, all that I can hope from the books that I write is that they might be a comfort to someone somewhere at some time. I know that there are people who think the idea of a book being your friend is ridiculous, but I think that there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, I think it's a shame not to have books that are your friends. And when I think of literacy, when I think of what it must mean to not be able to read, I think that it is a deprivation not just of knowledge, knowledge, enlightenment, and opportunity, although it is all of those things, but it also denies a powerful source of refuge and friendship. 
Winston Churchill, who was not only a voracious reader, but an extraordinarily talented writer, who supported himself for 70 years with his writing, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, said that if you cannot read all of your books, at any rate, peer into them. Let them fall open where they will. Read from the first sentence that arrests the eye. Set them back on their shelves with your own hands. Arrange them on your own plan so that if you do not know what is in them, you'll at least know where they are. Let them be your friends. I still have my first copy of I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. I brought it with me tonight. It has come on a long journey with me over many decades and to many places, and it will always be one of my most treasured possessions. But more than that, it will always be my friend. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome novelist and winner of the 2016 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, Marilyn Robinson. Good evening. It's a wonderful honor to be here. Sometimes you know, this, this building is a celebration, much more than a monument. And uh, to be included in an event of this kind and to be among the people that sustain it and love it is a very, very moving thing. Um, I taught writing for a long time to gifted writers uh, very, who, who enriched my life for many years with their brilliance and grace. And while I uh, taught, I talked about experiences of my own that made me feel the importance, the, the qualitative significance of, of reading. Um, these are some, a couple of not quite anecdotes that I, I often mentioned with my students. Um, <clears throat> in any case, I remember quite distinctly what it was like when the difficulties of my new literacy, my marginal literacy, somehow became the utter trance of childhood bookishness. When the resistance offered by unknown words and complicated sentences fell away before my absorption in almost any book that fell into my hands. When children love books, the experience they find in them is unsought and engrossing like a dream. I realize how important it is to me now to have been haunted and enchanted by Edgar Allan Poe, to have laughed myself to tears over the lesser works of Mark Twain, to have been given the collected poems of Emily Dickinson by my big brother. The sense of progressive initiation has been part of it all through my whole life, together with an impulse and desire to speak into that great conversation. An experience like this has been the privilege of very few people historically, very few human beings. It waited on the technologies of printing and publishing on public libraries and on the historically recent assumption that literacy should be the norm in society. Now it is hard to remember that it is individually an achievement and collectively a privilege and that the modern world is unique in the extraordinary degree that it is structured by and permeated by written language. We tend to think of things that are fruitful as if they are to be valued for their utility. We forget how objectively wonderful they are. I have had a few opportunities to speak with people who are or who have been incarcerated. Typically, they have come to reading late, or at least from marginal literacy to actual literacy, for reasons that are familiar to all of us. They have been brought to books by boredom and loneliness and restlessness with the thought that they are excluded from knowledge of another life. One man told me that he had been drifting from bad to worse 
And then I read a book, he said. That was the first time I realized that the world was something I could be interested in. The fruitfulness I've spoke of is the change in this man's life, in his mind, without reference to potential contributions to society, which might very well be modest, as these things are conventionally reckoned. Anyone who remembers being struck and moved by a book knows something of his experience and knows that it is an excellent thing in itself, a real liberation, without any reference to practical consequences. I mention these conversations because they have made me particularly aware of what we, as a community, give people or deny them when we make them fully literate or leave them in a state of exclusion most of us cannot imagine. They remind me also that the written word is unaccountably rich and powerful, efficacious in the matter of food and drink and the light of the sun. And here we are, the wealthiest country in history, wondering darkly about the wisdom of our investment in the humanities. Will our children enhance a corporate profit margin as a result of reading, even studying, leaves of grass? Quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question being mulled, really, is whether we should invest so much social wealth in providing a great part of our population with an acquaintance, at least, with their human heritage. Stinginess creeps. It finds its own logic in, in irrefutable. Increasingly, public assets are spoken of as public burdens. Why, after all, lock up so much exploitable wealth in national parks? Do we really need all these great universities? We, the public, could be impoverished radically before we understood the nature of the loss. An incarcerated woman said to me, tell your students to write good books. They're all we live for. What would it matter if that sustenance were denied to her? Who would even know? This is a metaphysical question. So is the disputed value of the astonishing, the astonishing communion we have among ourselves mediated by books. How we value her solitary, obscure human life, how much wealth we are honored to share with her, will speak directly to the kind of civilization we are and will become. This great library is a proof of the value our society has placed in the world, of, in the world civilization of readers, writers, and books. I cannot begin to reckon the pure good I have taken from American fiction, American libraries, American education, the prize is, this prize that I will receive is profoundly gratifying to me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of our inspirational authors, members of Congress, and sponsors. To those of you watching at home, I hope you will join us tomorrow at the Convention Center or tune in to C-SPAN, Book TV, or PBS View, Book View Now, who will be broadcasting live from the National Book Festival, and I will be tweeting the entire day. <laughs> And now, would you please join me in the Great Hall for a buffet supper and enjoy the festival. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.